Great, we're going to start um, trying to respect your time. A very good morning to everyone. My name is Zolani Mito. I work for the JX Travel uh, Fellowship as a Programs Officer. I'll be facilitating today's dialogue, which is going to be exploring low tech strategies for education in South Africa. It's a truly exciting dialogue. This is the second episode of our, of our series of three dialogues. So I welcome everyone, especially those who were with us um, even last week. Thank you for, for tuning in again. So as we're going into the dialogue today, I kind of bullied our CEO into joining us today um, so that he can give somewhat of, a, of, a, of an introduction to, to who Jake's Travel is. So pretty excited about that. And it feels great to, to be able to bully a CEO into doing, uh, into doing things. Feels nice. Uh, thanks, Solani. Um, I uh, really appreciated being on the other end last week, but it is nice to uh, just say hi to everyone. And again, as you said, welcome to those um, who joined us last week uh, and those who are joining for the first time um, this week. My name is uh, Julian Hewitt. I am the CEO of Jake's Cable Fellowship. And it's a real privilege to um, have this opportunity to say hi to you today. So really, I just want to take a couple of minutes. Um, we've got an excellent panel and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say today. But I, I want to just start by giving you a little bit of context around uh, why Jake's Havel Fellowship. So obviously the name of this webinar series, Educating in Interesting Times, has um, quite an immediate goal. I think there's quite a crisis in the system right now and a lot of people are anxious to understand what that means. And, um, but I think it's really helpful to also just reflect on uh, what jo Professor Jonathan Janssen said last week. Uh, he's also the chair of our board. And he really said that, you know, at the end of the day, what COVID-19 uh, is doing is, um, is really shining a spotlight on the inequalities that are already there, rather than necessarily creating them, um, at least at the moment. And so I think what we're really looking at doing through Jake's um, Havel Fellowship is a longer term game, which is about changing the status quo. And the way we do this is by um, nurturing teachers who embrace innovation and lead change. And so obviously that's a long term game. And we, we do this through offering a full university scholarship that has a lot of mentoring and leadership opportunities to really expose and groom aspirant teachers whose life work um, in this country will be about educating in interesting times. So um, I just also want to reach out um, one more um, section around this um, Jake's Havel Fellowship opportunity. There's two thirds of the people that join us um, every year were nominated by exceptional teachers and education leaders like you today on this panel. And um, so we will just share how you can go about doing that. Um, there's a very easy link on our website. And then the other exciting opportunity for us is at the moment, the scholarship's open for people in first year and uh, in grade 12 to apply. But literally today, we are opening a brand new stream up for people that already have a graduate degree and are under the age of 30 and uh, who are wanting to pursue a PGCE through one of our university partners. So there's a brand new fellowship opportunity that literally is opening up for the very first day today. And um, we're really looking at bolstering um, these, uh, these teachers um, in our education sector. So that's just a little bit about Jake's Havel Fellowship. Obviously, you can go to the website and find out more information. Our applications are live. But I also just wanted to uh, take this chance to um, uh, then really share a little bit about why we are here today. And um, just set a little bit of the tone. And I'm very excited to have Zolani then take us through um, the rest of this um, second dialogue. So um, then just in terms of um, what really brings us um, uh, together, so uh, this is now obviously the, the second part of this webinar series. Um, and um, the first one was really laying the, the foundation to understand where we're at right now. I think there's a lot of confusion, things have changed quite rapidly. And so people were really trying to understand, well, what is key? What is a priority for me as a teacher or a leader in this space? And what are some of the things I can take home that are gonna help me make more sense of um, this issue in carrying on the provision of quality education? And today we're gonna to take more of a deeper dive, um, more of a practitioner view, more of a grass view, uh, view 
specifically around this idea of low um, income schools and really understanding if um, this is the context that you find yourself in, what are some of the pieces of the puzzle that our panelists today can give you to make more sense of that? And then next week we will end this webinar series with then looking at what the high tech environment looks like um, and some really useful platforms and ways people are approaching the, um, uh, the curricula in this regard, but also realizing that um, as a society, we are moving towards a more collaborative technology enabled education environment. So understanding what that could mean in a few years time and what's more scalable in our country. So um, I guess maybe just in terms of how you can engage with um, uh, the session today. Uh, one of the things I highly recommend is it's great to see how active um, the chat room is. Um, if you have a specific view or organization and you're doing something of interest, we want to hear from you. So please feel free to share that on the chat room. We want this to be a very collaborative experience. Um, the solutions lie in all of our realities and experiences. So um, please do share that. Um, that's a really um, a, a treasure trove of information for us. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much again for joining us. And, um, and then I'm gonna really just uh, from here um, say that as an output, we will send you a YouTube video of the session. We will send you an output document of the session. And we will also send you an invite to our final dialogue next week. So this will all come your way. But um, what I'm gonna do now is just really say thank you um, for joining us and hand back to Zolani to take you through today's structure. Thanks a lot, Julian. Um, that was really uh, a great way to start. And I'm happy that uh, you, know, you agreed to be bullied. So thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, Julian always has a really nice way of you know, consolidating the, the JGF message and what it is that uh, JGF or Jake's Travel Fellowship sits to do. So it's always great to, to have him speak on that. Um, so Julian has already spoken about what it is that brings us together and uh, you could tell he was speaking at it from a CEO perspective. You can, you can kind of sense, uh, you know, the very high level, um, you know, speaking, but I think just to sort of drift it down and I put the slide up before, but really, you know, last week we spoke about how we are confronted with, uh, you know, a, a global pandemic that has resulted in the closure of schools in over about 60, uh, 165 countries globally. Um, but also one of the things we also reflected on last week is that, you know, there, there seems to be a digital inequality that is, you know, shined light upon by, by the epidemic and Julian touched on that as well. Um, and then also one, some of the conversations that we had last week were around, you know, whether or not the classroom environment should be um, this limiting factor to where teaching and learning occurs. And so today we're also here uh, to have a dialogue around that to explore what these low tech strategies really look, uh, really look like. But I think above and beyond that, we, we care about uh, these low tech strategies because we acknowledge that, you know, there are contexts in which people don't necessarily have access to high bandwidth and people don't have access to technological resources. And so it's quite essential that part of the conversation as we speak about a digitizing education system, we also, you know, almost in parallel, try to find strategies um, for, for empowering even other environments. Uh, so essentially we are looking for low tech strategies that will help us to resuscitate our education system um, during this COVID period and post COVID uh, also. So for those who were here last week, you, you, un, you will all, almost understand the structure and the format already, but for the, for the benefit of people who are only joining us today, um, you know, the structure we follow is that we're going to be here for two, two hours together. Um, we'll be engaging through an online platform called Mentimeter. I'll take you through how it works uh, just shortly. But what Mentimeter is, is it's an online engagement platform where you'll get to ask questions and engage with the panelists. You would have noted already that you can't talk, you can't say anything. I'm sure a few people were already anxious that, oh my God, am I missing sound? 
what's going on. The webinar is set up in a way that uh, only the panelists can engage and that's to just eliminate the sound really. So you, uh, you'll be engaging through Mentimeter. You go to www.menti.com. www.menti.com. When you get there, you'll notice that you're asked for a code. The codes will be made available to you uh, via the PowerPoint slide that you are seeing on your screen at the moment. There's also going to be Twitter engagement using uh, the, the hashtag JGF webinar. JGF webinar. So it's hashtag JGF webinar. Please tag us in everything that you say, uh, whatever you're posting, just tag us at JG fellowship at JG Fellowship. Um, so we'd like to see uh, what you're thinking about. So ask questions on Twitter, make comments, whatever comes into your mind, uh, you know, as a spur of the moment, just put it there. And then also my colleague Sife uh, will also be trying to answer some of the technical questions that you might have uh, via the Q&A, uh, the Q&A section of, 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 of uh, this webinar. You'll notice at the bottom bar of your Zoom, uh, for some people, maybe it's your first time using Zoom. So you'll notice at the bottom bar, uh, there is a chat room and there is a Q&A uh, option there. So as Julian said, use the Q&A session section as you, as, as you see fit in the chat room. Um, they are there for your engagement really. So the people that are joining us today as panelists include uh, Ashley Visahi, who is the CEO of uh, Bottom Up. Um, Ashley is, you know, is someone who's passionate about how we can use young people to, um, to enact, how we can enact young people's voices in order to address some of the challenges in South African schooling environment. So Bottom Up focuses on um, promoting change through involving youth in participatory action research. Um, so we're really pleased to have you uh, here with us today, Ashley. Thank you. We also have Zameka Lubeluana, who is uh, a head coach at Fundawande. Uh, Fundawande is part of the Ellen Gray Obis Foundation Endowment. So pretty excited to have someone from the family. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for joining us, Zaza. So, you know, Fundawanda focuses on, you know, um, capacitating school teachers on how to teach uh, reading for meaning between grades, uh, grade R and four. So we're truly excited to see and hear what Zaza has to say to us today. And then we're also joined by Melanie Smarts, who is the founder and CEO of Streetlight School. Many of you may know Melanie and or may know uh, Streetlight School. Uh, we're, truly, we're truly excited uh, excited to hear about more of the innovative ways in which Streetlights has been able to, to improve, uh, you know, learning and achievement in, in, in South Africa. I think you guys have been doing amazing work. So we're excited to have you here, Melanie. We also have Kangelani Sibia, who is a multi-award winning uh, educator. Uh, Kangelani has won numerous awards, uh, especially last year where he was given a Global Teacher Award in India. He was also given a Global Educator uh, Award in, uh, in Dubai. Um, he's, I think he, he mentioned that some of his learners call him Dr. Max. So we're truly excited to have you here, uh, Kangelani, with us. Thank you. Later on, we'll also be joined by uh, Wambaru, uh, who is from Kenya. She's the CEO of Eneza Education. Wambaru will be giving us, you know, some perspectives from other African countries um, in terms of the work that they do as Eneza. So that's another person that we're excited to have today. She'll be joining us a bit later because I'll be engaging with her through, uh, you know, questions uh, and she'll be giving a perspective that is somewhat different not entirely different, but I suppose a contrasting narrative to what um, we may expect from South Africa. And then also, we have a correspondent here joining us, Yves Uwe Mtuhu, who is a Jake Schreval Candidate Fellow. Yves Uwe is studying at Bisok Sai at the University of Cape Town, specializing in history and geography. He's an aspiring teacher, and we're excited to hear what Yves Uwe's correspondence is going to be based on what the panelists say today. 
So I mentioned that uh, we'll be using Mentimeter as a form of engagement. So just uh, to practice, I would encourage you to, I'd like to have you go to menti.com and then try to answer the question that's there. The code for answering the question is 132621. The question is, where are you joining us from? 132621. I think Gauteng and the Western Cape are bullies, eh? It's always Gauteng and the Western Cape that are dominating. We're seeing people from the Eastern Cape. KZN has representation. We see someone from Bumalanga. There's also someone from Limpopo. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, I see more people are, are answering here, and I think we're getting a sense of how Mentimeter works. The next question is, did you attend our last, our dialogue last week? Okay. We're seeing more people from last week. That's a good thing because it means we didn't bore you. Okay, we're having a lot more people that were here with us last week and I want to welcome the 77 who, who weren't here last week. Welcome. Um, I would imagine the number is going to grow, but this is just a practice run uh, for you to get a sense of how Mentimeter works. So I welcome all these people who've joined us for the first time today. Welcome to the second episode of our three um, episode series. And the next question is, what is your role within education? What is your role within education? You seeing a lot of teachers, school teachers. There's some people who are in student support, welcome. We have interest groups in the house. We also have educational entrepreneurs. Welcome. We welcome the lecturers or academicians. Educational leaders, you're also welcomed. Okay, thanks, that's a good indicator. And I'm also imagining that the number is going to grow. And then just lastly for this practice run, which organizations are here? Isasa, welcome. The Sozo Foundation, we welcome you. DGMT is in the house. Okay, a lot more people are in the house. Numeric is here. I think we should eliminate JGF. We already know you're here. Okay, the Western Cape Education Department is here. I know they were here last week as well. The numbers, uh, the, the letters are getting smaller for my like ability to see, so I'm struggling at the moment. We welcome everyone who has joined us today. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, like I said, this is going to be quite an engaging uh, conversation and we're truly excited to have you uh, join us today. So really just as a form of grounding, right? Um, I think I want to point out that part of you know, the, the rationale behind this series is just an acknowledgement that globally education systems have been drastically disrupted. And I think I mentioned last week that this is the first time since the Second World War that schools globally have shut down almost at the same time and for the same reason. Now, one would anticipate that this has implications for how the schooling environment looks post the COVID uh, epidemic, but it also has implications at a recovery phase to see um, how educations recover from something like this. I think it goes without saying that the South African education system has been under numerous challenges, um, with challenges around numeracy, 
um, with challenges around literacy. And so these are key challenges that may be exacerbated or may not be exacerbated as a result of the lockdown and the schooling moratorium. But also there are other psychosocial implications that come with the COVID-19 outbreak. Last week, we were also talking about how the schooling environment isn't just about cognitive uh, learning, but it also is a social space where people get socialized, but also school is a space of acculturation. Schools are also a form of social security for the many. We understand that South Africa has learners who get food and, uh, and nutrition from school. These are some of the challenges that actually compound you know, whether or not we're able to recover from this. And so we're really excited to have our panelists to help us really understand you know, what some of these approaches could be uh, that we can take, especially uh, from, uh, from a low tech perspective, because the schools that are likely to be hit hard, like hit hard by this are the quintile one to three schools, which are generally no fee, uh, no -fee schools. So to kickstart this conversation, then I'd like to speak to you, Ashley, uh, because you spoke quite passionately around the issue of, you know, addressing the structural inequalities, but also understanding what they are. So maybe ground us in maybe, you know, conceptualizing what these structural inequalities are and what the relationship is, um, you know, with the schooling environment. Thank you, Zulani. Good morning and good morning to everyone listening as well. I think may maybe I will start with um, a letter that I was reading just last night by an organization called the Progressive Principles Association, and which is a collection of uh, school principals. And they had penned a letter responding to kind of the uptake in re remote learning or wanting to kind of adopt online strategies within the school context and obviously highlighting how unsustainable that would be um, given our education system is bifurcated in the way that it is. Um, for me, that's an interesting letter, um, number one, because it, it kind of recognizes the issue, but I think it almost raises a bigger question than just the, this kind of discussion between low tech or high tech strategies, because we, we're saying, for example, teachers are not prepared to, it, begin teaching online in a situation of inequality, but there's something bigger. And I think it's almost, I mean, when you use the word resuscitate our education system, we've got to ask the question, is it even something that we want to resuscitate or is it something that we want to reimagine? So are teachers, for example, not just not willing to uh, teach online, but should they be willing to go to classrooms when the pandemic is over um, when schools have such um, poor infrastructure, where we're sitting with hazardous school buildings, where we are sitting with schools that are understaffed and under-resourced, um, those are less than optimal um, situations to be teaching in in any case. Uh, but the point that I, that I really want to make about inequality in South Africa and particularly related to the education system is I think that number one, all of the issues that we face now with our pandemic is obviously exacerbated by structural inequalities, not least in the healthcare sector with people's access to public health, things like water and sanitation services in, in certain communities where this doesn't only place people who are poor or people who are living in urban townships and ghettos at risk, it actually places everybody at risk um, because it makes the situation that we faced with more unmanageable um, or, or uh, more difficult to deal with. And the same thing is also true within the education system. If you think of our education system uh, and the way in which it's split into two, basically we have a system which serves those who have money and those who don't have money. And one which, for example, makes access to a quality education, a function of how much money my family earns. And that similarly, like our health system, doesn't only put those who don't have access at risk, it puts us all at risk, simply because it underdevelops the majority of our country's youth who actually have no other choice but to attend low or no fee uh, schools. So, so that I think is an important point for us to think about. And in this time, when we're talking around COVID-19, 
there are obvious like immediate challenges which we have to face and which we have to deal with. Those include things like how are our students eating every day? So access to food. Are our students safe every day? Um, given that we know that some of our parents are actually the ones who are standing in front of the till or packing shelves at the grocery store so that we can access our food, uh, what is, where does that leave their own young children who are sitting at home? So these are kind of the immediate challenges to deal with. And I think a lot of the NGOs and organizations that are on even this call are doing a lot of excellent work in trying to respond to those immediate challenges. But at the same time, I think it's also important for us, whilst we deal with those important issues, to also step back for a moment and consider what some of the long-term effects might be of what I think is sometimes almost quick fix solutions which are being offered up at this time by various stakeholders. So for example, the adoption okay, of I, IT. Um, sorry, Ashley. I'm yes. going to stop you there because I think you're already meandering towards the next phase of the conversation. Um, no so problem. thank you. I think you've provided a great contextualization of you know, what these structural inequalities are and what some of the challenges uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, and you were talking about the idea that are we even supposed to be talking about resuscitating or reimagining the education system? Um, and you're raising some of the concerns to say in talking about low tech um, you know, approaches, is it supposed to be that teachers you know, should want to go into classrooms in a, in, a, in a situation like this? And these are some like legitimate concerns that are there. And I'm looking at you know, the hopes that people have uh, out of this conversation. And this brings me to you, Zaza, because one of the hopes, and it's actually at the center, is around rural school children. And you are based in the Eastern Cape, right? And so the conversation is around you know, some of these low-tech strategies uh, for addressing uh, you know, educational challenges. So take us through you know, what are some of the low-tech um, you know, approaches um, you know, that you see happening or being employed in the Eastern Cape, or what do you think some of the, the realities are, at the very least, from that side, and at least from a rural education perspective? Okay, thank you, Zolani. Um, I'm, I'm really going to start uh, from what Professor Janssen mentioned also last week about the inequalities, um, especially in technology. Um, so if you, if you take the township schools that we are working in, and therefore we looking at the parents um, uh, of those schools, you kind of have to look at what is really accessible. And in terms of um, availability, what is available right now that mo we are mostly making use of is really a, a cell phone, right? Um, I'm going to look at the, I'm going to first talk about the, the side of the parents, like what the parents can do, where they find themselves in a situation where they literally want um, education to continue with, um, with their children, but the only thing that they have at home is a cell phone, where WhatsApp, for example, is, um, um, is made use of in terms of groups. Um, and when it comes to parents, I mean, sorry, to, to the teachers um, that we are also working with here, um, also it's, it, they're making use of the cell phones, like the WhatsApp groups. And we, we know that at some point the, the, the teachers were given some, um, had received some laptops, for example, which is one thing to have, but with no data, again, uh, it's a struggle. And also with um, the level of computer literacy, li li how literate are they in the computers and how far can they make use of those computers? So that is um, the situation. And, and I'm just talking about the township, let, township uh, areas, let alone them, the rural areas. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite limited. And uh, I'll, 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 can I stop them? Is that fine? <laughs> sure. Thanks a lot, Zaza. Um, you know, you, you're raising some, 
some issues around uh, the, the, the computer literacy of, of teachers. And this appears to be, you know, something that's coming up again, uh, even following from, from the conversation from, from last week. Uh, it's a common mm. thread. You're talking about the, the idea of using, um, you know, cell phones, uh, people using WhatsApp groups and all that. And you're talking about and all that. And, you know, the, the general trend there is that there needs to be a device present. There has to be a device that's there that can be used. Um, now, I'm, I suppose my curiosity is around in the absence of a device. What, what strategies would look like. And it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, strategies for now, you know, in while we're in a lockdown, but we perhaps need to start thinking about the more preparation perspective of the conversation as well. From a preparation perspective, um, you know, what other uh, methods could be uh, employed? And I'm looking at you, Melanie, because uh, I know you also do a lot of work um, in the rural Eastern Cape. So maybe take us through uh, some of the, the things you, you, you've seen happening and working, um, maybe in the Eastern Cape sector, in the, sorry, in the Eastern Cape that hadn't necessarily involved technology, but proved to, to have um, a level of effectiveness or where they did involve technology, it was at least uh, at minimal use. Um, what, I guess what, what I wanna start by saying is maybe it's not that there isn't technology, it's just maybe that what we think about as technology needs to look very different. And radio is technology. And not only in South Africa, but in Liberia, during the Ebola crisis, currently in Kenya, in Rwanda, and a lot of places, um, the way that um, education departments and individual NGOs are thinking about this problem is saying, what is the lowest common den denominator tech? And, and what can that lowest common denominator tech do for us? Um, and I think that's that's actually the right way around to think about it. So instead of thinking about um, what kind of educational delivery do we want and then um, distributing accordingly, uh, the, the right question, especially in the, in the context that we work in, where we know that um, the pre-existing inequality is getting is exasperated, is to say, what does everyone have? Everyone seems to have radio. Um, the second thing that even in, in the very rural Eastern Cape where, where some of the, the schools I'm working with with Axiom are, are located, um, a lot of people have WhatsApp. Maybe if students don't have WhatsApp, someone in the family has WhatsApp. Um, and then to say, okay, well, uh, if most people have radio, if like 60% of people have access to WhatsApp, if a, a further uh, sort of 35% of people have access to phone technology, uh, what does that look like? Um, and I think I want to just come back to what I think is, is from, from other cases we know, so from the, from the Ebola outbreaks, from um, uh, places of conflict um, and disaster management where they've tried to do education, the thing that we know is um, we actually don't really know a lot about how to teach um, distance learning. We don't know what's effective. We don't know how to check for understanding. All of these things are still really hard and up in the air. We'll learn a lot during this time. What we do know is that, that learners need to feel connected to school because when they don't feel like school is real anymore, um, all the social issues that we are worried about um, come back. You know, learners engage in risky behavior. They're more exposed to abuse. Dropout rates increase, which you already know is a problem in this country. Um, and so, so what we need to do is use those very basic technologies like radio, like WhatsApp, like calling parents, like sending texts to, to tell learners like, hey, we're still here. Hey, you're still connected to learning. Um, and, and even just that feeling, you know, that might not be learning, but it's certainly schooling. And it's certainly a, a massive part of education. Um, and that's something that we can do. And we absolutely have to do right now. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Um, I like, what, I like what, you, what you were mentioning about um, 
trying to think um, you know, quite differently about what we see as tech, because I think you then started to come into some of the, the conversation that have already been happening. And I know the Department of Education has also been quite intentional about putting content on radio, putting content on, 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 on TV, um, and all these other platforms, right? It, it, it's all there. And then you are mentioning the idea of learners needing to feel like they are connected to school, right? This sense of connection to school. And I suppose that speaks not only to, to the idea that perhaps we don't know how to do distance learning, but that the learning culture perhaps needs to change. And that's what crisis does. And I remember even from last week, there was this idea that crisis changes behavior crisis changes how we do things and perhaps learning culture then is challenged to change now. So the next question is around, you know, we have, so you were mentioning that people have access to radio, people have access to WhatsApp, to cell phones, yet there's still this challenge of learners not feeling like they can learn. Firstly, there's no sense of agency, um, even when these WhatsApp conversations are there. And I suppose then my curiosity is around, um, you know, what some of these, I suppose, behavioral changes could look like. Um, what, what should be, you know, a behavioral change in terms of how people learn and where people learn. And Kangelani, you, you spoke um, quite passionately about the role of the parent in all this. Um, I, I'm trying to see if you're still with us. Uh, Kangelani, are you here? Kangelani? Okay, it seems like Kangelani is having some technical issues there and um, he, he couldn't hear me. But I want us to speak to this idea of, um, you know, changing learning culture, right? Because now we, you no longer have a teacher in front of you and a learner no longer feels that sense of responsibility or you know, you're not in a classroom. So what are some of these uh, you know, strategies to changing learning culture? What could we do to empower parents as well um, in this regard? And Ashley, do you maybe want to speak to that? Sure, uh, Zolani, I think parents are, incredibly important during this time because that's where our, that's the kind of first teacher of our children um, even outside of a pandemic situation I think and I, I maybe want to share one initiative um, which is the COVID-19 People's Coalition which is kind of a, a group of different uh, academics, NGOs, uh, practitioners, teachers we have come together during this time and part of that initiative um, in the kind of ECD and basic education space, they've tried to create um, a parent manual which can actually help uh, parents in the home. And the idea is not to kind of recreate schools at home or to, let's say, turn your kitchen table into a Montessori uh, school, <laughs> but really actually to look at what are the ways in which we can continue to encourage the growth and development of children? Also, what kind of anxieties might children be experiencing in the home during this time with adults talking about things like the coronavirus and um, just having to be kind of stuck at home? Uh, so definitely interesting. And the, I guess the key issue comes down to our, our conversation that we're having is how, do, how does one do distribution, right? Um, so we might think of low tech as being sending PDF files via WhatsApp groups or things like this, which are whether it's low res or, or low data. Um, but even that might be actually high tech for a lot of people. Um, so other, other people thinking around distribution through things like grocery stores, since that seems to be the places where people are meeting, but in an environment where we're not supposed to be, I don't know, touching each other, I don't know. It's a, it is a real challenge, Zalani. Thanks a lot for that, Ashley. Um, and you know, the issue of parenting and the involvement of parents uh, is, is, you know, is appearing to be quite a critical issue in this conversation. Um, I'm looking at, uh, at the screen in terms of what people identify to be key barriers to, to home-based learning. And obviously the issue of data is there. It's a, it's a cross-cutting theme. Um, it, it, it's common. 
but I think someone raised an issue around uh, the fact that most parents aren't even educated themselves. So to expect that they'd be active participants in helping their learners is, is a bit of a stretch. And so maybe there's a conversation we need to have around capacitating parents. And I think, Ashley, you were also talking to this a bit, uh, the idea that you know, parental involvement is also contingent on parents' level of education, but also um, other factors. So, Zolani, if I may respond, I think, sure. I think we need to separate education from schooling. Um, so there's formal schooling and that's the delivery of the curriculum um, or trying to do these kind of structured activities. And then there's education, which is actually happening all the time around us. So even in the environment of the home, I mean, if we turn on the news today, there's forms of learning which are taking place and may, perhaps not the best. So how do, we, how do we take what's already around people, their lived experiences, maybe even of working in the grocery store, and, and equipping parents maybe with the tools to let's, let's think about that more deeply. So what does it mean that we in a lockdown situation, but some of us are still having to go to work or some of us are still having to expose ourselves in certain ways. Um, and so to think a little bit more broadly about what we mean by education and what we hope, for example, could take place in the space of the home, rather than I think like, let's try to convert our curriculum into a way that we can get this into people's homes, uh, whether via the internet or even via kind of low-tech print me media. I think, I think the separation between those two things are, are, are actually important. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. Um, sorry. There we go. Uh, so I, I like your distinction around the difference between schooling and education and um, you know the idea that we perhaps don't need to convert the home environment into a schooling environment but that education and learning should be able to continue even within the schooling environment. Um, I think Zaza you're trying to say something. Yes, so um... It, it is, it, I think it's important also to consider the fact that we, we, we have these different parents, right? And, uh, we, and see this as an opportunity as well to, to really get hold of the parents. And I'm talking about the parents of the, again, I'm going to go back to the township schools where we still have a lot of work that we need to do in terms of the community or the parents' involvement in the um, children's education. And as as this um, pandemic has really um, uh, displayed that the parents who are now showing interest in, in, in what they can do, what is it that they can do with their children at home. So um, yes, there are uh, uh, challenges of um, the level of parents, whether they are educated or not educated, but picture a home who is in that home and who can we take an advantage of in terms of really um, trying to bring this level of people to the participation of the education. Sure. Thanks for that, Zaza. Great insights uh, to say, you know, even though we may see challenges, but there's an opportunity here. So I've put up a slide for attendees to ask questions to, to the panelists. Um, so I'm just going to be waiting for people to, 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 to write down their questions. Uh, while we wait for that, I think I want to point out that in the previous slide, you know, people had to rate, you know, the level of importance of some of the key issues and people identified this idea of equipping learners with strategies for self-study as one of the key things that, um, you know, we want, we want to do or at least as something that's important. And then they also touch back on this idea of uh, television broadcasting, the television broadcasting of learning material uh, and that it also holds an essence. And I suppose that speaks to, to the general idea of, you know, the national coverage in terms of radio and TV. A lot of people now are having more access to television and, um, and radio. But I suppose then these are points that are interlinked, right? Because you can have a TV, you can have a radio, 
but I suppose without the necessary skills for self-study, then that exercise almost becomes, uh, you know, useless as well if there isn't, um, you know, that avenue for learners to, lo to, to learn how to self-study. Because this is a period where a lot more on the learner's agency is, is, is sort of challenged and, and asked upon. So I just want to check on the questions that, um, that are on the screen for the panel. So the first question, um, I think it's a more, it's a more practical question. I think um, maybe you can speak to this, Melanie. The question is around what strategies the Department of Basic Education, um, you know, can 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 employ to reach out to to marginalized learners who have no data and access to to technology. Um, so the one that I want to push is. And the regulations under the Disaster Management Act actually enable ministers to make decisions that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to make. And one of the, the decisions I think the DBE should really be considering is mass zero rating of educational platforms um, and access and provision to data um, because they have the power to do so. Every single organization, I think, working um, at solving these issues is coming up with this issue of access to data. Um, and if they wanted to go, you know, so, so, so there are fantastic exist, pre-existing examples of um, good education and learning content being zero rated. Um, what I really want the DBE to, to consider doing is, is looking at what people are using and zeroing the costs of those as quickly as possible under the regulations of the Disaster Management Act. Hmm. Sure. Thanks a lot, Melanie. The next question is, uh, should learner agency uh, not be the focus post this, uh, this pandemic? Um, and I suppose this is a question around, um, you know, learning culture as well and all those different things. And Ashley, do you maybe want to speak to that? Thank you, Solani. I think for me, this is probably the most important piece of, the, of kind of the situation that we're in and also what happens after the pandemic, because it's really about how do we get students involved, not just in kind of um, doing schooling or doing education within the home, but actually inviting the voices of students in to reformulate things like policies which actually affect their, their lives, their schooling, and their families as well. So, and I think we're living, uh, your title says education in interesting times. We indeed are living in interesting times because what we are seeing now at a global scale is people beginning to adopt certain policy measures um, or releasing funds, repurposing businesses, um, and prioritizing certain needs which people have been calling for for ages in various kind of uh, uh, activist uh, settings. These things that were once considered radical are now no longer considered radical, they're considered necessary. And I think we need to actually include students in that process of recognizing uh, if this is possible now, then or after a pandemic situation. So, so for example, if we're releasing the funds, if we are um, repurposing businesses, if we are prioritizing certain community needs, these things need to be kind of on a permanent policy agenda in a post-pandemic situation. And I think the way that people can do this, even in their own home, is to take the news. Um, if you just turn on the television and you watch what's happening in the world today, there's so much going on. Um, and even, even our, our stories of our frontline, I mean, I used the example of the grocery store worker. If you take that grocery store frontline worker, we recently just heard stories like um, 102 million rand is being given by one of our retail giants for kind of as an appreciation bonus for grocery store workers. Uh, should should people be fair? Grocery store workers actually being paid fair wages or living wages because these very grocery store workers are the parents of our children who are now sitting in a predicament where they have to go to work, but they're also unable to kind of provide for all of their family's needs. So these are the questions which I think young people need to be engaging in. 
so that they can actually make policy recommendations um, to government and to institutions who have the power actually to change things um, in a post-pandemic situation. Sure. Thanks a lot for that, Ashley. Um, perfect. Uh, so thank you for that. You, 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 uh, your entry reminds me of what you said in your writing when you were talking about the idea that, you know, um, we may talk about the involvement of parents and, you know, how learning should happen in the home environment. But you're talking about the idea that this might be difficult if families aren't even able to self-sustain, where families can't sustain themselves. And so priority, and this reminds me of the conversation from last week around, um, you know, people's safety before learning and people feeling the need to prioritize uh, their safety before they can care about learning. And so it is a difficult uh, situation. And so that's why we, I, I, I suppose we're curious on what the solutions would look like. And someone was asking here um, whether, and I suppose this is quite a controversial question, but also very important for, for the conversation. The question is whether or not, um, you know, we should be going back to schooling sooner than later. I think this question is linked to a fear of what the implications of going to going back to school later would be. Um, so I'll ask this question and, and tie it to you. Um, sorry, has Kangalani joined us? Kangalani? Hello. Okay. He's not here with us yet. Um, so I'm going to link this question back to you, uh, to you, Zaza. Um, at least in the, in the Eastern Cape context or the, the space you're finding yourself in where you are equipping teachers uh, and capacitating them in, re in, in, in teaching reading for meaning, would there be value in going back to school earlier in that context? Would that make a difference? Um, and also sort of pair that with the sort of risks of, of that, right? Putting teachers in, in a schooling environment in, in a context like this. Thanks, Solani. Definitely, there is a value of um, learners going back to schools, of schools getting back to normal in terms of um, teachers uh, being able to, 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 con to continue and teach teacher and learners in like reading for meaning. So you take, for example, um, uh, the situation whereby currently this is what we are sitting on in we have this group of parents, right, that we are trying to support in, in helping children to, to read at home. And we have a situation of parents reporting that um, their, their, learner, their children are saying that, no, you are not my teacher. You are not teacher granny, just remain a granny and uh, you are not a teacher. So the mentality of learners really actually seeing the value as well in terms of uh, being in school and engaging with the teacher in front of them and the other learners. So I think that um, as much as we are faced with this, it, it, it is um, important that with the schools are back to normal and uh, the teachers are continuing with what they were doing and what we were supporting the teachers in, in terms of um, teaching reading for many. And you and, and I would imagine then if that were to happen, there would be there would need to be quite rigorous measures that are put in place for that. So, you know, uh, screening protocols, um, yes. changing hygiene culture within schools and all those things. Yes, and um, definitely Zolani, but um, again, one needs to also think of the difficulties in that because remember, we are sitting with the schools that have high big numbers as much as this. It, it would be valuable for the learners to go back to schools. But if you look at the township schools, we are sitting with uh, classes with uh, 50 learners uh, or 60 learners in, in, in a class. And how, how does one then really um, practice being um, safe and also uh, in that kind of situation? So it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite really a, a, a tricky situation for the town for the schools that are really having problems already in the township schools sure thanks zaza 
um, in all honesty, it looks like, you know, going back to school would actually be a higher risk. Um, and I think this is a conversation about going back to um, protecting people first, uh, and then education comes secondary. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to admit, uh, but I suppose then the, 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 the approach is, is also around trying to find ways in which we can maximize uh, that education happens even at home or in whatever space that it happens. But one of the questions that came up through the Mentimeter is around schooling and leadership. Someone was saying our schools are led by people who don't want to change. So how do we address this challenge? Kangelani, I see you've joined us. Uh, can you hear me? Can you confirm that you can hear me? Kangelani? Kangelani, you're not audible. Kangelani? Okay, it looks like he's having serious technical difficulties there. But someone was making comment on, on, on the issue that, you know, schools are led by, by, by people who don't want to change. And this issue around school, you know, school leadership has, has been a key challenge, but I think it extends beyond schools. You know, leadership in the education uh, system has been, you know, a major concern. And Mel uh, Melanie, can you speak to that? You know, what do you think the, the sort of shift and changes in, in, in how leadership uh, is conducted within education is going, what would that look like post COVID? And how would a change in, you know, leadership culture aid, uh, you know, how fast we recover from the effects of the COVID-19 epidemic? Um, yeah, I just quickly, before I answer that question, I just want to go back quickly to what Zaza was saying about reopening the schools and the, you know, uh, this is really a question for epidemiologists, but I think when we think about the health considerations, we have to consider public health considerations at large and where education really plays an impact there. And again, I want to go back to the example in, uh, in, during the Ebola crisis, something that, that happened is there was a massive uptick in teen pregnancies. Um, we've already seen a significant rise in domestic abuse. These are also public health considerations. And when we talk about the balance of should we open schools or close them, we need to also consider the, the, the other public health downsides of keeping schools closed that compound over time. And those are, are risks, especially to young girls. They are risks to school nutrition and they are risks to especially women and children um, at home. So it's, it's and, and there are case studies all around the world where people are balancing these trade-offs. Um, but to go to your question around leadership, again, I think what we're seeing is uh, maybe in the early days of this crisis, we thought everything would change. And actually, I think what this experience has highlighted for us is how actually the intractable issues remain the same. So places with strong leadership, during a crisis, you see people respond, you see them come up with solutions, you see them kind of innovate. Um, and in places without strong leadership, you see the opposite happening. You see the difficulty of um, uh, uh, teachers checking out early or leaders not knowing what to do. Um, and um, I think what, what we do really need, and I agree with you there, is um, kind of the shining examples um, of people responding powerfully to this crisis to kind of come out to be amplified, to be used as models in the community. And the second thing is, I think, um, we saw even in the schools in the Eastern Cape where, uh, for instance, we do have massive issues with teacher attendance and things like this, but through a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of an example of how to be a leader, a little bit of a feeling of you can contribute during this crisis. We've had teachers who uh, really, we struggled with attendance suddenly they're on WhatsApp every day talking to their students. So it's also, it's, it's also giving people the benefit of the doubt and inviting them to be part of this moment. Um, and people might surprise you. Solani, you're on mute. Thanks for that, Melanie. Um, you were mentioning some of, you know, the public health consideration, um, you know, around the, the, the lockdown. And I remember reading something to say uh, schools in the townships are already subjected to, to break-ins. 
um, schools get broken into, computer labs lose, um, you know, some of their assets, things get stolen and it's a reality. There was, you know, a circulating video yesterday of a school that burnt down in KZN. These are some of the realities. So, you know, there's an, there's an open opportunity here for, for, for looting of schools. So there are challenges, right? Uh, there are challenges on, on, on both ends and, and really issues that we, we ought to take quite seriously. But I see Wambura has joined us. We've been speaking quite broadly about some of these challenges from a South African perspective. And, uh, sorry, just got distracted there. I think Kangelani got audio for a second. Um, so we've been speaking quite, quite broadly uh, about these things from a South African perspective. I'd like to welcome Wambura who's been able to join us. Uh, Wambura is joining us from Kenya and uh, she's the CEO um, of Eneza Education. Uh, Wambura, can you maybe uh, give us a sense of what the challenges are in Kenya uh, in terms of what the, the schooling moratorium has meant, um, especially for, for schools uh, where the poor uh, go? Okay. First of all, hello, everybody. I, um, it's good to come into this context and also listen a little bit to what's happening in South Africa. I'm learning quite a bit. Um, Zolani, tell me if you can't hear me, but um, so in Kenya, I think the problems um, seem quite similar to what um, is being described here. In terms of the, some urban well-to-do schools where education has gone on, uh, maybe after a little bit of a hiccup, the kids were sent home, but um, because they had technology at home and in school, learning continued remotely um, without um, much, uh, much of a problem. Schools or class are meeting over Zoom or over Microsoft Teams and learning is going on. But that's a very small minority. Um, what you find is, of course, you have, um, people in urban and both and rural contexts as well who do not have um, access to these opportunities to continue remote learning via technology and those have um, their learning has basically been interrupted and they've gone home and going home introduces a new context especially for those who say are boarding school students who now have to participate in the in the social and economic activities of the home as well as feeding their learning and perhaps are in contexts where um, they, once they finish their day um, of other social and economic activities, they get to maybe 5 p.m., the sun is about to set, they can read their books, their notebooks for an hour or two, but they don't have electricity in the, in the home, which means they, then that also puts limits what they can do at night. So you have challenges like this going on also in our context. Thanks a lot, Wambura. Um, now, just a follow-up question. Can you take us through what the government response has been in Kenya? Um, what has the government response, especially uh, as far as education is concerned? Uh, what strategies have, you know, have been put in place uh, from the Kenyan environment? Okay, so I will speak specifically to what um, the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development is doing, which I like, um, because like I said, there was a lot of excitement about um, going online and uh, there was a lot of talk about that until people realized this is serving um, only a small portion of the students. And the KICD, um, which is our Kenya Institute of Curriculum Deve Development, has taken up um, running radio programs um, that uh, match the curriculum. So they are producing radio programs um, Previously, they were running old radio programs. Now they're in the process of uh, developing new ones. Um, and I know this is one-way communication, but it really helps many more of, um, of the students than the online learning was helping. Um, and so that's, I think that's a key initiative I've seen in, try, in the government trying to um, serve um, public school students and um, students from economically disadvantaged um, situations um, is radio and a little bit of TV, but radio learning and dissemination of curriculum via this, this, this format. And it's important because um, people have battery powered radio, right? 
um, which means it can last long. It doesn't rely on, on, on electricity. Um, and then we have, um, shall I say what we have done, Zolani, as Eneza, or that's another question? I shall proceed, okay. Um, so at the same time, we at Eneza Education, at Eneza Education, what we do is we digitize the local curriculum into bite-sized modules which can be served over the most basic device. It can be served over a 2G phone. So what we do is we take the national curriculum, we break it down into bite-sized modules and organize it and serve it via um, our platform to any mobile phone. Uh, we do this because we believe that um, one of the, and we keep saying many um, there are many problems that um, ail education in Africa and around the world. And we want to focus on one, which is a lack of access to um, affordable quality learning materials. And so that's, that's, that's the only one we want to fixate upon and, and um, solve well. And what we've done at this point, um, because our content can be accessed by anyone as long as they have a mobile phone. We've partnered with um, Kenya's largest um, telco, um, they're called Safaricom, and we've opened up our platform for free uh, for use uh, to anybody around the country for the next two months, which hopefully will also help students. The same student who would listen to a radio would have access, we think, to a mobile phone, uh, which only needs to be charged once every three days. And so they can use our, our platform as an alternative learning tool. That's it, Zalani. Thanks a lot, uh, Wambura. Really great insights there into what um, Kenya is doing. And I think, you know, having listened to you, um, I'm having a similar feeling to, to, to the kind of feeling I had when we were talking to Amand last week, who was speaking from Canada, that, you know, the generally we think these problems are unique to us or that um you know we are the ones who are struggling with a, a response and so it's always great to to get uh, a different perspective and i like what you're mentioning about uh, the use of radio um in kenya uh, because it, it is a platform that the south african government has also tried to to introduce i think as of the first of april so lessons have been there on radio and on tv um, so it's quite nice to see that, uh, you know, we're at least doing something. It isn't that nothing is being done and, um, and people are left to, to their despair. And I was looking now at, um, you know, some of the, the hopes that people had for this conversation. And someone raised an issue around, um, you know, maximizing the access of learners who, who don't have access to Wi-Fi, to online learning. So, you know, the conversation has been pretty much about, oh, people without access to, to Wi-Fi, we should make all these alternatives for them. But the question is, how do we still include people who don't have access to, to Wi-Fi on online learning platforms so that it's not this elite space? I think by virtue of it being online, it does make it an elite space where only people with access to Wi-Fi uh, can participate in online learning. But the question is the how do we maximize that? I suppose a simple question would be give people data, but we've seen the minister's initiative around uh, data free surfing for like, uh, from companies like Vodacom and MTN, uh, et cetera. But what are some of the strategies uh, through which we can give people access to online learning material um, without uh, you know, really feeling like we are condemned by the absence of Wi-Fi? Kangelani, are you with us? Yes, sir. I'm sure you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Finally, welcome. Wow, uh, thanks so much. Yeah. We, we are happy to have you, Kangelani. Uh, can you maybe answer this question? How do we you know, give people access to online learning uh, um, so that it, it is something that is accessible to even people that come from lower quintile schools? Um, what would be the best strategy there? Oh, okay. No, thanks for, so much, Baba. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm sorry for the network, Then I was having a problem with the network. Um, however, before I answer that question, I would like, us, I would like to go back a little bit um, 
on the question on how then the parents can be involved, then after that I would shoot straight, straight to this question. Then to me, for the parents to be involved or to let parents to be involved in helping our kids in studying during this time, I think the, the, the first thing that I would say is that if the parents can try to sit down with their kids in, 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 in creating the, the, the study timetable to say, at this time, maybe to say from four to five, they have to do mathematics for an example, then after that they perform what they're supposed to perform at home, like uh, the, the, this thing of cooking and so on. But after that, then what are, are the times that exactly they have to study with? And they also have to create the free times other than to just allow our kids to study at any how. So if, what I can say to parents is that the first thing that they have to do is to create the timetable, the study timetable with their kids. And again, in order to make it a point that um, the kids are studying, I would encourage parents to, even though they cannot uh, teach, uh, they cannot assist because they don't know anything, for example, in mathematics, but what they can do is to observe why they, 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 their children are learning. I think that can, that can also encourage their, their, their children to learn, to just observe, to sit down with them, and also encourage them to say, to make them understand that this is not the holiday time, but then they have to, to study in order to catch up with everything. As, as my colleagues also indicated that there are radio programs of which they don't require one to have like access in, in, in Wi-Fi, of which they have to make use of, 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 of radio programs. However, now I'm happy because our department started the issue of trying to put the like SABC programs, TV programs, of which I, 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 I applaud for that because I understand, for, for example, in mathematics, obviously you cannot study mathematics uh, on radio to say you cannot speak, uh, say if you derive in something, what, whereas our kids cannot see. So it's better if everything is on TV. But however, Going straight to the to the question of saying how can we how can I, how can our government assist us? Maybe the first thing that I would like to mention is to say if our government can try to to make it a point that our WhatsApp uh, 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 platform to be zero rate to say everyone or any child that using WhatsApp uh, uh, it must be for free or to say uh, 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 since there is this thing of of for the fact that our our learners are registered if maybe our our learners they can be given like a free access to to any wi-fi so as they would access any online material or any or any online lessons i think that is the best way that our government can do to say they give access or free access to to to, to, to wi-fi to all of our our kids or even to all of us because of this time and after after that they can go back to, to normal and everything when everything is okay that is my intake then thanks so much. thanks um, sure thanks a lot uh kangelani really great insights there and you know you could tell uh you're a math teacher your reference to 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 the fact that people can't learn differential calculus via the radio just gives it away um, and you were talking about, you know, the differences also between radio and TV, et cetera. But I think towards the end, some of your insights were, nearing to, um, were meandering towards the idea that, you know, uh, data-free surfing or access to data um, could be a critical step that uh, the government takes in order to maximize access to online learning platforms. And I think that's something that came up uh, even last week uh, as, a, as a core theme. Now I want us to move towards, you know, the next phase of the conversation, because I think we've been speaking quite broadly around the lockdown period. We're going to move to a period where schools have reopened. We haven't, we, we're no longer in lockdown, but from an epidemiological perspective, there still needs to be critical measures that are taken in schools to make sure that, you know, we, we still 
contain uh, the spread of, of the epidemic. Um, and I, I would see these as sort of no tech strategies that you think should be taken within schools to make sure that learners re remain healthy, to make sure that teachers remain healthy, but also quite importantly that teachers and learners feel a sense of psychological safety within the schooling environment. So take me through what you, you think some of these strategies are. And I want to start with you, Ambura, to, to, to get a sense of whether this thinking has already started in the Kenyan environment. Is this something you've started thinking or, or, or the government has started thinking about? And do you have any idea of what strategies uh, people are currently thinking of? Um, I have not had this um, conversation going on in Kenya. The interesting thing about where we are in Kenya is that April is, is a school holiday month. Mm -hmm. So we had just closed out and people were closing, um, closing for the holiday this month. And uh, we're looking to see whether in May we will actually go back to school. So this conversation, I am afraid I not, um, I would not be a source of expert information on it. If you would allow me though, Zolani, I would like, if I may, to, to quickly answer the, the previous question because I have insights there, if you wouldn't mind. No, absolutely. Yeah, um, because I think, um, I don't know whether it's, this has happened in South Africa, but it happened in Kenya as well, that somewhere along the line, introduced an actual phone number you could call um, despite the fact that you download their uh, app onto a smartphone they introduced a number you could call if you wanted to get an, an uber and for me this was a very interesting outcome i mean a, a very interesting thing and we're wondering why it happened and i realized it goes back to what supports an online life and i think that an online in order to support online education you need three three factors. You need a, a device that can access the internet. You need um, a connection, like a Wi-Fi connection, a broadband connection, a telecoms connection that can get onto the, um, onto the internet, but you also need the data, right? And unless these three factors are working together, you find that you cannot support a widespread online life, whether you like it or not. And in order to get, um, to get our students online, we need to um, work on conversations with our governments and other suppliers to drive these three things in tandem. Because um, you could have um, internet available all around the country because maybe your telecommunications have taken, uh, companies have taken it there. But do people have the right devices to get online in a way that um, enables them to perform the duties they want to perform, the teacher to teach and the student to learn. Are those connections themselves reliable? And if they are, are they affordable? Right? So the data, is it affordable? If any of these three things is amiss, then you have a, you have a problem. And I think that that's what's important when you're thinking in your country, and even when we're thinking in our country, how do we support online learning for the masses? We must take these three things forward uh, together. I'm sorry for taking you back, but I thought that would be interesting um, to put there. No, Wambura, those are you know quite important uh, things you're mentioning. You're mentioning data. You know, you're mentioning the the reliability and devices. We're in an African context where it seems that all three facets are a challenge. You know, devices are a challenge. Uh, the reliability or affordability is a challenge. Um, access to data is a challenge. So it, it's quite tricky then uh, in this instance. Uh, is there any initiative that uh, you know, has been taken to maximize access to devices in Kenya? Um, so we did, they did start a pro, um, we do have um, a program that was supposed to provide laptops to children in schools. Um, it's had a mixed success, but it was something that was started in schools um, a few years ago. Um, some of those devices have been distributed. Some of them are still uh, locked in, um, in 
rooms because they are not being used by students, but there was an initiative like that, and I think you would say it's ongoing. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think uh, what we also need to realize is it's just not our context where in every context, context in the world, everybody is struggling with the concept of online education, not just in, in Africa. In California, they are struggling with the fact that they, are, they have remote learning, but they have absenteeism has spiked completely. Somewhere else in the US, they are struggling with the fact that uh, some students are, are uncomfortable allowing people into their home, to look into their homes, because um, their homes are as, as not as what, as well, maybe they come from socially um, disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, when they look at the way their homes look compared to their classmates on, online, then they hesitate to uh, participate. They suddenly feel like they're less. These are all online issues or issues to do with online or remote learning is what I'll call it a myriad. And we need to understand that we're not the only ones struggling with it. The question is, in fact, I think that we, in EdTech um, are sort of in a, a global pilot. We've had all these tools we've been working on for a long time online, and suddenly the world has said, okay, bring them all. And this is a, an opportunity for learning. And we are all ga gaining insights. Those insights will take us forward. But um, the questions we have, we need to be answered together with all, with the entire learning ecosystem. I don't know if I've answered your question, but this is what I really think that everybody in the learning ecosystem needs to participate in finding the answers to which is the best way um, forward. That's uh, very comprehensive, Aurora. Um, thank you so much. Uh, great insights there. And now I want to go back to that question, which is also going to be sort of our last question is, you know, around some of these other strategies that would need to be put in place. Um, you know, for, for our remission phase where we are back at schools, we have some level of control over the epidemic, but obviously there still needs to be some measures that we take within the schooling environment. Uh, Melanie, do you have any key issues that you think would be important for teachers and school uh, educational leaders to note, firstly, as part of their planning for the reopening of schools? What kind of factors should they be taking into consideration as they go into that? You know, you can speak to some of uh, the considerations. Sure. Um, so I think, again, I want to speak from the social perspective and then from the kind of more classic educational perspective. So from a social perspective, I think we have to um, consider, um, again, like what it, what it will be like for learners to have lost to have had this massive disruption to their lives and to have been in the, you know, not only in the home, but locked in the home and unable to connect with, with their community or friends in the way that they would have normally. Um, there will be a lot of trauma. Um, at Streetlight last year, we had to close the school for two weeks um, due to the xenophobic riots. And the week after we reopened, we spent very little time in academics and spent a lot of time talking to learners about how they were feeling, surfacing issues, having conversations about their experiences. And I think I would encourage educators not to rush back immediately into getting back on track with the curriculum, but to actually hold that space for learners to communicate about their experience, to, to say what they've been through, to give voice to what that experience has been like for them, and to really do a pulse check on what it is that learners need. Um, from an education and, and then to, to actively draw back learners to school. So those kids we didn't manage to reach um, that disengaged. Um, you know, even in the UK, they're seeing spikes of school aged learners applying for jobs in supermarkets at the moment. So, you know, to Wambura's point again, this is not a African problem. Uh, there's a, all across the world in, in different contexts, learners are disengaging from school. Um, and we need to really actively think about that re-engagement process. Um, academically, I think one of the things we have to consider now, regardless of your, um, where your school is situated, is recurriculation. Re and I think in South Africa, this is quite an opportunity to get back to the basics. So we know that there will be lost weeks of schooling, and actually in many ways, this is an opportunity for us to say like, okay, well, a pared down curriculum, looking at the level of learners where they are actually at, 
thinking about the really, really basic fundamental skills that we want to teach learners. How do we do that? Um, and I think in South Africa, again, when we think about the basics of literacy, which as I can speak to in numeracy, um, this is an opportunity for us to say like a highly simplified curriculum that really focus on core skills. What does that look like and how do we implement that as schools? Um, and again, there are examples from um, the rest of the world that, that we can draw on. That, that, again, everywhere from Liberia to New York is trying to figure out how to do that. So we should, we should be a part of that global conversation. And then the last thing I just want to say on the reopening um, from kind of global lens, lessons from influenza and other cases like this is there are different scenarios. So sometimes schools will just reopen wholesale. Sometimes schools will open some portion of the school, but not other portions of the school. Sometimes what will happen is schools will open for a few weeks, then close again, then open for a few weeks, then close again. Um, it's very possible in our scenario that we will see schools reopening for April and May, but then closing again June, July. Um, so I think it's, it's again, it, it, you know, I don't know that we can feasibly plan for, for what's going to happen, but I think it's worth us being aware of the multiple options out there and also looking from a holistic perspective, the social needs of learners, the, 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 the value of schooling and education balanced with what um, epidemiologists tell us um, are the, the real considerations with this, this kind of a pandemic. What, where does that land for education? We need, a, we need to have a very holistic view on that. Thanks, Melanie. Um, really great. Um, you spoke about the idea of recurriculation, uh, you know, rethinking the way the curriculum looks. Um, and you're talking about the idea that even other countries are, are, are seeing learner disengagement. Um, so it's not a uniquely South African challenge. Uh, we are in a country where dropout rates are quite high, where, you know, only 40% of learners who start school actually make it to matric. So I suppose that sort of makes the, the nuances even um, far greater for, for the South African education. And there's also a rural urban divide in some of these challenges. Um, so there definitely needs to be quite rigorous planning then that goes into uh, the post COVID-19 phase, because I suppose bearing in mind the risks that you're identifying, taking on the learnings from the Ebola outbreak, uh, the SARS outbreak in the Middle East, you know, you can almost anticipate that dropout rates are likely to, to, to skyrocket, um, you know, pass rates are likely to also drop. Um, but also more than anything, another consideration here is the issue of stigmatization and how it impacts uh, learner engagement within the schooling environment. And, you know, people already have constructed varying perceptions of um, certain people. You cough once and in South Africa, people run away from you. Uh, well, not only here, but globally, people are now scared of just anyone coughing around them. Um, and so these are some of the considerations then uh, for the post-COVID uh, phase, I suppose. And Zaza, take me through what you think some of these considerations would be and how they would look, especially for the Eastern Cape context. Okay, thanks, Solan. <clears throat> as much as we have um, really not engaged in preparations of um, when we open, but I'm really going to agree about um, two things. One, um, I think it's going to be very important for the state to really play a bigger role in terms of um, what provisions are they making for the schools. We know if you look at the township schools, rural schools, where teachers are even struggling to get stationary. So I think it's going to be important for the state to really um, make provision for the schools. And the second part is really that, uh, that I'm thinking of is, is connected to the stigma. And with that part, I think it's also with the platforms that we are already having with the teachers, it is really going to be important to really prepping these groups of teachers in terms of how they handle going back to schools and having this, the, 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 um, this class full of learners. So if you have been in one of the township schools in, during winter and, and where every child is having flu, and so it is really going to be important to really equip the teachers in terms of a different way of dealing with this situation that they will be faced with. 
Thank you. Um, you're mentioning the issue of capacitating teachers as we move forward um, so that the communication also and the engagements with the learners um, you know, are also quite informed uh, as, we move, uh, as we move forward. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I want to give maybe Kangelani, uh, since he, uh, he was struggling to join us. Kangelani, do you have any insights that you're sitting with and you feel like you want to share um, with us today? Thank you so much, then. Yes. Um, maybe the first thing that I would like to, to share about with this issue, the, the, the last question about the provision and everything when we go back to school. Um, well, what I want to indicate is that it will be very difficult indeed, especially for the um, rural schools. You see, like if you look at my school, in class, we have around about plus or minus 80 learners in, in one class, for example. So it will be difficult, obviously, when we, we, we go back, because even if we can say uh, learners will be firstly tested or screened out for the, for, for the virus. So obviously, it will be difficult because here in rural areas, you may find out that it, it, it is even a problem for our kids to all come to school. So it will be also a problem. However, I think our department would we, we, we'd have something based on that to say how can we monitor the situation to say if we all allow all our kids to be to be tested, our educators to be tested, or of which it would be also difficult because we have large number of learners in, 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 in one school, for an example, and it, it will take time. It won't be something that will take place before to say before the end of May, it can take almost two months in order to do that. However, what I can say is that if uh, uh, this thing of online lessons, uh, uh, radio programs, TV programs to, to proceed even after the lockdown in order for us to familiarize us with uh, this thing of fourth industrial revolution to say, even though the, the, this thing of, 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 of coronavirus is over, but learners to be used to, 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 to technology. Because by look of the things, so many uh, viruses that may come, uh, of which whenever they come, finding us that we are, we are well prepared for that, of which this one, it, 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 we were not prepared to say, because even our learners cannot believe in learning through online. They want to see the teacher in front of them, of which we also have to, 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 to work on that as teachers to say, how can we assist them to see the needs of learning uh, uh, even wh whereas the teacher is not in front of, of them. However, I, 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 the, the issue that I also want to, 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 to indicate is that there are so many companies that have assisted, like if we talk about Siavula, of which if you go there, there are so many activities that are there for free for all grades, especially for maths and science, of which learners, even learners, that, those that they don't have access to Wi-Fi, they can also make use of Siafula because there are so many activities there. There are so many uh, uh, documents that they can download and make use of, of it. And one can also upload the fact that there are teachers that are working very hard through WhatsApp, even though there are challenges there because there are learners that they simply join our WhatsApp to just play around because they cannot see the importance of this, of which we, we, we are finding it very difficult even also to, 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 to run this WhatsApp group. That's why I ended up opted the issue of downloading or asking them to download Telegram because Telegram uh, you, you, you only about, it's about plus or minus 20,000 uh, learners that can join of which it would be easy for the one to, to monitor that group of which if we can also try to make use of Telegram other than WhatsApp group because like myself, uh, I have around about plus or minus 74 WhatsApp groups of which it is very difficult to control all of them of which I, I opted the issue of using um, Telegram because Telegram taking like a large number of, of, of learners. However, we are praying to say um, if, uh, because our prayer is to say if our government or if 
um, our scientists, doctors can come up with the vaccine or any cure of which that will, will make us to be easy for us to go back to school freely, not afraid of anything. Because we have a problem of large number of, of, of learners in our classes, especially in rural areas. Thanks so much, then. Thanks a lot, uh, Kangelani, um, and for the suggestions there of how you know, you know what the alternatives are to using WhatsApp groups. Uh, I think that's, that's available for, uh, for people who, who are attendees today. Um, so really what I want to do now is to go, uh, go back to you, Ashley, because um, you, you speak quite passionately about what the, you know, what the, what the macro changes should look like. Uh, at least from a systemic and institutional uh, perspective. So I kind of want to see and, and hear from you what you think, bearing in mind the situation we're in, we already know what the problems are. We understand the situation around inequalities, et cetera. What do you think uh, the institutional response should be moving forward? What would you see as the kind of next step uh, from, from the situation we're finding ourselves? to address some of the challenges that we've been speaking about. Thank you, Zolani. I, I think some of the proposals which have already been made by different actors, and there was a wonderful article, for example, from UWC yesterday, again around things like national health, health insurance. Um, if we actually put energy and effort into making these kinds of programs uh, a reality um, so that we don't have uh, or continue to have uh, stratified healthcare systems or education systems or water and sanitation services, et cetera. And we have adequate housing or proper housing for everybody. Then I think even a situation like this, um, whilst we have no uh, control over it, we would be better prepared for it. Um, and we, we wouldn't suffer um, the kinds of effects, for example, that we're seeing even in other places of the world where there's also inequality um, and where the poor are, are the kind of worst state. Um, it just recently shared um, in one of their news reports in Chicago how 70% of the deaths from COVID-19 in Chicago have been black people. Um, even though the black people over there only make up about 30% of the population. Um, but that also has knock-on effects for everybody else who lives in Chicago because the problem is unable to be controlled because not everybody actually has access to basic services. So things like a national health insurance. I think also with um, more close to home in education is uh, many researchers, academics, and activists have been talking for a long time about how education is actually underfunded in South Africa. Um, now that runs contrary to the idea that education takes up a large portion of our GDP. Um, if you actually look at the budgets for basic education and equal education has done some work on this, you can see that basic education funding has actually been decreasing in recent years. Um, and the amount of spend per learner uh, in the South African context actually means we don't, have, we don't have enough to actually provide everyone with a quality education the way it sits. So we need to find ways of how do we put money into that fiscus and where that money will come from is a, is a big question. Does it come from taxation or, or otherwise? Um, but these are key issues. Even at the beginning of 2020, um, if I may add, at the beginning of 2020, just a uh, year, yeah, we're sitting in the Western Cape and I think Gauteng, a similar situation where people were struggling to get their children into schools. Um, there's a, I mean, just not being able to actually find a place in schools because there aren't sufficient classrooms. And, and I work in some schools that are in under-resourced uh, or under-resourced schools rather where people are being crammed into classrooms where the teacher is sitting like by the door because she can't handle, let's say, all the smells and the sounds that are happening in the classroom, which is crowded. So going, reopening schools in that situation, whilst we are unsure, is not going to work. So we actually need to find ways where we can fix those problems in the long term. Um, and that means putting more money into the education system and then rolling out the projects which are actually going to uh, solve those uh, much broader uh, problems. 
Sure, thanks a lot. Um, really great there. I think you're speaking more around the sort of intersections between these different systems, understanding that, you know, in the absence of proper housing, it may be difficult for us to talk about um, even preparing uh, the education system for another epidemic, because as long as children still live in informal settlements where learning isn't conducive, um, you know, you're also speaking about, uh, you know, some of the challenges from a, a fiscal perspective, the idea that, you know, the spend per learner is quite less. Um, and I suppose that's also like, you know, uh, another issue that raises major concerns and many other concerns to say, do you keep on throwing more resources? Do you prioritize where resources go? What does the spending look like, etc.? There's a plethora of questions that you could be asking um, even in that regard, but also even as it pertains to public school schooling, you can see uh, the differences uh, amongst public schools. So the, the more nuances here, and I think, you know, we've, we've kind of had a great kick into this conversation, but I want to hear a different voice. We have Iviwe here, who's been listening to this conversation, and he's an aspiring teacher. So I kind of want to hear what Iviwe's thoughts and insights are based on what has transpired here today. So if you, I want you to give us maybe a reflection of, you know, what you see the conversation to have been, and also some of your recommendations and hopes and fears as an aspiring teacher. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, so what I got here is that the, impo oh, the importance, um, I think I actually spoke on this, the importance of um, reimagining our current education system. Um, who, as I spoke on e structural inequality, and this thing really got to me because um, just yesterday I spoke to two different teachers from Ekala and the Lady Fair, and they said it's not most of the time it's not even that the schools do not have devices. Um, the the department does give some schools devices in rural areas, but they're not being used. They are just sitting there, as Wambura said. They're just sitting there because the schools or the areas do not have service. So we can talk about giving people devices, teaching people, you know, free data and all those. But what if a, a, when a place does not have service, they won't be able to access anything. So if we have these kind of issues happening in our country and we are trying to go a step above, whereas we failed in the basics, I don't think that will work. There are just too many confounding variables um, that our schools are experiencing. Crime also, you know, schools, they, um, the government gives um, laptops. One teacher from Kala said the government gave her school laptops and in two days, only 11 of 36 laptops were left. How do we deal with these things? If we're going to talk about technology, so now we can, the government understands that not every learner can receive these things and tries to give it to a school and then they have these timetables. We have realized that most rural areas in our country does not have electricity. There is no electricity. Secondly, the parents themselves do not have cell phones. One teacher who has been teaching for 36 years cannot use a laptop. She says that the government, and especially in a circuit in Kala, they are not taken seriously. They don't have workshops. They don't know how to use the systems. They don't know what Google Classroom is. So if we have these problems and we're trying to go a step higher, I think we need to mitigate these smaller issues in order to look at this issue of um, educating remotely. That kind of seems a bit impossible um, in a lot of our countries because it's not cost effective. Now, um, Melanie spoke about um, how we think of technology needs to change. How do we use what we have in order to deliver the curriculum effectively? We look at things of, for example, we realize now that technology is relative. To an Eastern Cape learner, for example, technology means a laptop and maybe submitting a test or whatever, getting resources from a teacher. But if you look in the Western Cape, for example, a learner from bishops, technology means a robot, for example, those kind of things. So how we look at this, we need to look at all the different lenses and look at what is present and how we can then try to not necessarily um, or, or try to make things equal for everyone. But if we look at access, we don't, we mustn't look at 
at the current problem now. We need to look at everything else that influences our current problem. And one major thing is access. And ideally access to everything. We cannot work with places without electricity with no service. Give them all the laptops, give them free data. How are they going to use these things without having service and electricity? And that's what I'm getting here, that how do we then make sure? Because we now I think we are acting in a, you know, it's a state of emergency and we're trying to bring all the, the fast solutions, but we failed in the basis. And even if we bring fast solutions, it's impossible, or it does not seem now possible that even in the near future, that learners in the rural areas can then have these access. So for example, my auntie who's a teacher in Lady Frey, because there's no service, cannot tune in in this webinar. She can't find creative ways, for example, and she's a teacher. She's meant to tell her learners about the fourth industrial revolution that she has never experienced. So these are the challenges we have in our country. So I'd like to hear more on how we can, we can address these things. How do we then increase access, not only to devices, but to service, electricity, those kind of things? And how can teachers in this time teach without having those? How can my auntie in Lady Fray find creative ways of teaching without having access to service? And I think that's all I have to say, um, Zulani. Thank you. Thanks, Ivewe. Uh, you can see the passion there and great insights also at the same time. Um, I want to put you on the spot, Ivewe, then just, you know, briefly. You know, you're also saying that, you know, there are all these challenges and you want to hear how we can address them. But I want to hear from you, right, as an aspiring teacher, having been through and you're going through this COVID-19 education system and there are all these challenges that are presented by the emergency. How do you envision your future classroom to look like? What do you think your classroom in the future is going to look like? Because, because of my, let's say, of, of, of my privilege or, or, or kind privilege, um, we've tried, even a friends of mine, even from the organization, JJF, to, to host Zoom classrooms. And the learners engage, there's a, um, some accountability. We can ask questions, there's still engagement. But I understand that not everyone can have that. But I think moving into the future, in an, in, in an ideal world, um, in an ideal world, when everyone has access to data, everyone has access to, um, um, to Wi-Fi, we can have classes such as these, where learners can still engage with a teacher sitting in front of them and using platforms like Google Classroom where we deliver content, where learners can then give content back and still have feedback from teachers face to face. That's really an experience of a classroom without being in a classroom. So if we increase access, if we increase access, we can still have an engaging classroom, learner sitting on the other side and a teacher sitting on the other. So that's what I think that my classroom in the future might look, where I'm sitting at home still delivering content because I do believe no robot can really replace a teacher. But technology can help in, in us, you know, um, relaying that information to, to students. A teacher being in front of a student and still engaging or the teacher without being in front of the student can still engage with the teacher in real time so that's how i think future classroom might look where we use plus platforms such as these um to deliver content sure thanks thank a you. lot um and and thank you for for the passion um you know you, you're mentioning really great uh, great things around some of the issues around access the issue around crime you know, the fact that people still don't have access to electricity. And I think your points also speak directly to what Wambura was talking about, you know, uh, battery charged uh, radios may be of good use in this instance, uh, where people don't necessarily have access to electricity. So in as much as we finding ourselves in a difficult position, um, there's still hope. Um, there's still great opportunities that lie ahead of us. Um, the education system uh, has shown a level of commitment to addressing some of these challenges uh, through the different initiatives that uh, the minister in Jimutzecha announced. Um, so we've come to the end of this, uh, of this dialogue and I want to thank everyone that, uh, that participated uh, today. Really appreciate uh, the conversations from the insights on the Mentimeter. We really appreciate the insights um, from the panelists as well. Ashley, I want to thank you for bringing such fresh perspectives 
Um, I could tell that you are a researcher. Um, it, it's quite evident in sort of the way in which we are talking about some of the structural issues uh, that are there. Uh, I want to thank also Kangelani uh, for your recommendations and also some of the considerations you've put out there um, around, you know, some of the challenges with learning math and the differentiation between learning maths on TV and on radio and what that really looks like. Uh, Melanie, I think you've also brought a great perspective around uh, what the rural challenges may look like, but also some of the considerations that should come with this to say that, you know, there are other public health concerns with young uh, uh, teenagers getting pregnant, um, the fact that children still don't have access to food and what that really means for learning. Um, that was a great insight. Zaza, I want to thank you for bringing uh, great insights in terms of, you know, what the experiences are in the Eastern Cape um, and what, uh, you know, the approaches uh, should look like. You also started meandering towards, you know, what, what it would look like to open classrooms. And I think towards the end, you were like, actually, it's too risky. And I kind of appreciated uh, that sort of dance that you went through. So this was the second episode of, um, of the series. And uh, I want to remind everyone that we'll be having the third episode next week, uh, which is going to be looking at the more high tech strategies um, uh, for, for addressing some of the challenges presented by, by the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And then lastly, I want to also remind everyone that if you have an interest in the Jake's Travel Fellowship, please visit our website at www.jgfellowship.org. Have a look at um, you know, uh, some of the work that we are doing with aspiring teachers, but also remember you're able to nominate a learner. So if you're a teacher and there's a metric learner that you think would make a brilliant teacher, please nominate them. The nomination form is also available. We've also opened our graduate teaching fellowship that allows intake at uh, PGCE level. That's also opened and is available through our website. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciated it. We'll see you next week.